The central theme of answer to Job as of the Hebrew Christian myth is the relationship between man and Yahweh. Jung deals with this issue in terms of psychic reality and we will be able to understand him only if we know what Yahweh is as a psychic reality. The question is, what does Yahweh mean psychologically? In a 1933 seminar, Jung made these remarks. You all know what the collective unconscious is. You have certain dreams that carry the hallmark of the collective unconscious. Instead of dreaming of aunt this or uncle that, you dream of a lion. And then the analyst will tell you that this is a mythological motif and you will understand that it is the collective unconscious. This God is no longer miles of abstract space away from you in an extra mundane sphere. This divinity is not a concept in a theological textbook or in the Bible. It is an immediate thing. It happens in your dreams at night. It causes you to have pains in the stomach, diarrhea, constipation, a whole host of neurosis. If you try to formulate it, to think what the unconscious is after all, you wind up by concluding that it is what the prophets were concerned with. It sounds exactly like some things in the Old Testament. There God sends plagues upon men. He bumps their bones in the night. He injures their kidneys. He causes all sorts of troubles. Then you come naturally to the dilemma, is that really God? Is God a neurosis? 25 years later, in 1958, Jung writes the following in an important letter to Morton Kelsey. The absence of human morality in Yahweh is a stumbling block which cannot be overlooked. As little as the fact that nature, that is God's creation, does not give us enough reason to believe it to be purposive or reasonable in the human sense. We miss reason and moral values, that is, two main characteristics of a mature human mind. It is therefore obvious that the Yahwistic image or conception of the deity is less than that of certain human specimens. The image of a personified brutal force and of an unethical and non-spiritual mind, yet inconsistent enough to exhibit traits of kindness and generosity besides a violent power drive. This image owes its existence certainly not to an invention or intellectual formulation, but rather to a spontaneous manifestation that is, to religious experience of man like Samuel and Job, and thus it retains its validity to this day. People still ask, is it possible that God allows such things? Even the Christian God may be asked, why do you let your only son suffer from the imperfections of your creation? Further, in answer to Job, Jung writes, it is only through the psyche that we can establish that God acts upon us. But we are unable to distinguish whether these reactions emanate from God or from the unconscious. We cannot tell whether God and the unconscious are two different entities. Both are borderline concepts for transcendental contents. But empirically, it can be established with a sufficient degree of probability that there is in the unconscious an archetype of wholeness, namely the archetype of the self. All these statements leads to the conclusion that Yahweh as a psychic reality is a personification of the collective unconscious, especially in its aspect of center and totality, the self. It expresses itself in dreams and fantasies of an archetypal nature, in effects, instincts and intense energy manifestations of all kinds, in psychic and somatic symptoms, and in its specific quality of otherness, which goes contrary to the desires and expectations of the ego. Since the phenomena of synchronicity imply a fluid boundary between inner and outer reality, the unconscious can come to us from outside as well as from within. Hence Jung can say, God is reality itself. Answer to Job begins with an examination of Job's encounter with Yahweh. The book of Job can be considered as the pivot of the Old Testament. 
Here, for the first time, Yahweh engages a man as an individual rather than as the representative of Israel, the collective nation. This book thus marks the transition from collective psychology to individual psychology, from the election of a people to the election of an individual who must now encounter the numinosum on his own without the supporting containment of identification with a nation or a creed. Jung was appalled by the way Yahweh treated Job. He writes, When Yahweh was to play a particularly bad stunt on Job, he held a meeting with the devil and they discussed what they could launch on that poor fellow on earth. It is just as if men had come together to deliberate what they could do to pasture and tease a dog. It was exceedingly immoral, but that was not seen then, or people would not have been so naive about it. By relieving Job's experience and by bringing to it a modern consciousness, Jung has discovered an astonishing new meaning of that experience. By standing his ground and remaining true to his own conscious judgment, Job did not succumb to the moral condemnation of his comforters and thus created the very obstacle that forced God to reveal his true nature. Since Job did not fall victim to the proposition that all good is from God and all bad from man, he was able to see God and recognize his behavior to be that of an unconscious being who cannot be judged morally. Yahweh is a phenomena and as Job says, not a man. The result is that the man Job, because of his conscious awareness, is raised above Yahweh. As Jung says, if Job gains knowledge of God, then God must also learn to know himself. It just could not be that Yahweh's dual nature should become public property and remain hidden from himself alone. Whoever knows God has an effect on him. The failure of the attempt to corrupt Job has changed Yahweh's nature. In other words, the encounter with the creature changes the Creator. Job is a sacrifice for Yahweh's developing consciousness, the outward occasion for an inward process of dialectic in God. Job is the crucial book of the Old Testament. Considered psychologically, the Old Testament as a whole represents a vast individuation process unfolding in the collective psyche. Yahweh suffered a moral defeat in his encounter with Job and the unnoticed result was that man was elevated above Yahweh. This required Yahweh to catch up with man. God must now become man. He must incarnate. This means that Ezekiel's vision which shows God in the form of a man indicates that Yahweh has already undergone human incarnation in the pleroma, that is, in the unconscious. Thus, henceforth, the term Son of God will be synonymous with the term Son of Man. Since God has become man, mankind is now caught up in the process of divine transformation. God has fallen into man and man has become a participant in the divine drama. This fact remained on the symbolic, projected level as long as the process was confined to one man that is Christ, who was worshipped as divine. But now, with the psychological understanding of this imagery, the experience becomes available potentially to all individuals.